Turn with me to Romans 2. The passage this morning is verses 6 through 11. I'm going to start, though, in verse 5. So Romans 2, we'll read verses 5 through 11. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immorality, immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace and for your truth. We thank you for the way in which your word speaks to the true condition of our hearts, speaks to man's plight, and also speaks of coming realities, of the consequences of paths that are taken. And while the message of your coming judgment is not a popular one today, Father, as it's probably never been a popular one for rebellious men, we recognize its needfulness. And I pray that there would be a deep sobriety that comes over us this morning as we contemplate this reality and not only think about it as happening to those who are wicked, but thinking ourselves to be wicked and in need of the same judgment if it were not for Jesus Christ. I pray if there are any in this room that still are not saved, that are still dead in their sins and trespasses, that you would awaken them to life today, that you'd grant them a new heart they cause them to be sensitive to your word. They'd be broken down by the, the weightiness of their sin and the thought of your holiness and, and power. And then, then you would also convince them of your grace and mercy that are made um, available to us through your son, Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen. You can be seated. As we get started, I just wanted to say... I. Um, missed you guys last week. I don't have many opportunities to be at another church on a Sunday morning. Um, had the pleasure of watching one of my nieces baptized, and that was glorious, um, but definitely was missing you guys. I'm going to say thank you to Pastor Christian for filling in. I know it was a, it was a rough week as he wasn't feeling so well, and um, but both he and you, I heard from many of you, uh, just speaks volumes to the perseverance and character of Pastor Christian, also speaks volumes of your guys' love for us as pastors, um, many people saying they were encouraged and strengthened by it. So thank you, uh, Christian, and thank you, church, and missed you guys last week. Romans 1 explains what we are to make of the moral degradation of our society. It is a sign of the wrath of God. It's an indication that the Lord has given people over to their sinful desires. And the deeper the depravity gets, the, the further the moral degradation goes, the further evidence we have of just how bad it's gotten. For those people thinking that the LGBTQ plus and whatever else gets added after that movement, whoever thinks that's progress and achievement, Romans 1 is an absolute rebuke to that way of thinking. It is quite different from God's perspective, and that's the only perspective that matters. But then we came to Romans 2 a couple of weeks ago together, and we saw how those who would amen the condemnation being of those being described in Romans 1 are they themselves under judgment. We talked about the judges coming under judgment. For it's not merely those who can identify what is righteous that are exempt from the judgment to come, but only those who live in accordance with righteousness that would be exempt from the judgment to come. And the problem, so the problem for the pagan lies in the fact that he attempts to live life by his own standard, and he's going to be shown at the end that he's guilty of transgressing God's law and deserving of God's wrath. But the problem for those who have God's law and rightly recognize it as righteousness, the problem for all those who fall into that camp is their failure to live up to the standard that they know. 
You see, there are those who aren't familiar with all of the standard, yet they still have the law of God written on their heart, which we'll talk about later on here in Romans, and they're guilty of God's law, but so are those who have God's law, guilty of God's law. And this is what we're in the midst of discussing. You might be able to see the sins of others, you might even rightly be able to recognize those as sins and to be wrong. But then the further question is, are you without sin? You might not be guilty of the particular sin that is being highlighted in somebody's life. But does that mean you're sinless? Remember the woman caught in adultery? Remember they put Jesus to the task on that day? And remember what Jesus says to those who are gathered around? He goes, okay, well, whoever's without sin, you cast the first stone. And no one's able to pick up a stone. It's not only the openly immoral that will be found guilty of sin and lacking righteousness in the judgment. It is also, many times, the moralist, the legalist, the one who knows the law, the one who you know, tries to toe the line. But in reality, no human being has actually, besides the Lord Jesus Christ, actually towed the line. And there's the problem Every human being will be brought before the judgment seat of Christ, whether you're Jew or Gentile, man or woman, rich or poor, highly educated or poorly educated, all of us will give an account. And the standard that will be applied in each case is God's perfect righteousness. And of that, we all fall desperately short. Romans 2.5 makes clear that everyone will one day be brought before the judgment seat of God in the day of wrath. And no one's going to be able to escape that judgment. Again, we read, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Notice, you might have thought that was being applied to a pagan people. But we've already talked about them in Romans 1. This is a reference to Jews, primarily. This is a reference to people who had the law of God. This is a reference to people who were familiar with, with what God's standard of righteousness was. And here Paul says to them, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of God's righteous judgment. Now the verses that we're looking at today will kind of further fill in what is the righteous judgment of God. We're going to talk about, a little bit about the nature of God's judgment today through three characteristics. First of all, a fitting judgment. God's judgment is fitting. What I mean by that is it, is it is suitable. It is appropriate to the case. A couple things we could say about this is that it is a personalized judgment. Look at verse 6a. Who will render to each person? It's personalized. We're told that the righteous judgment of God is one that will take into account individuals. And each individual sin, it's personalized to the individual. Let me ask you a question. How many of you guys enjoyed being lumped together for consequences during childhood? Anybody like that? Okay, you know, your brother did such and such. None of us are going to wherever we're going to go. How do you guys like that? You guys enjoy those kinds of moments? Have you ever been in a classroom before? Like, little Johnny over there just ruined it for everyone. Everyone is going to get Rice Krispie treats at the end of this. Sorry, they're out. They're off the table. Nobody likes those moments, right? They're always the worst sorts of consequences, especially when you believe yourself to have followed the rules and to have paid attention and to have been respectful, doing whatever you've been asked. And then because of some other kid, you now have extra homework or you have to run laps or you don't get to go on some privilege or some trip. It could always also turn out that way in group projects. How many of you guys love doing group projects when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was definitely a two thumbs down on a lot of those. Um, I never enjoyed them much in school because inevitably what it meant is the kids who cared the most did the most work. And then it always seemed like no matter what, like everybody had to be involved. And so then eventually the kid who doesn't care at all is still involved and does a horrible job on their part. And the whole group's grade goes down as a result of that. And it's always, that's, that's tough. We might find many expressions of people being lumped together today. 
Certainly stereotypes and generalizations have long been around and people have been stereotyped and generalized into different groups and categories for a long time. That, that's nothing new. But maybe something that's a little bit more recent is movements like CRT, which have encouraged further expressions of this kind of idea where we segregate people into categories. In particular, usually their choice categories are the oppressed and the oppressors. And then they're, the oppressed and the oppressors are identified either by what they identify themselves as or by the amount of melanin in their skin or by some sort of ethnicity or something of this nature or biological sex. And as a, re a result of this, then they further this kind of lumping people into categories and, and either canceling them or removing what they have to say because they don't fit a particular dynamic that needs to be there in order to have say in public discourse. I know for a fact that at least a few of you in this very room have been called racist purely because you don't have enough melanin in your skin. And it's an odd phenomenon that here in America, where there is more liberty and more equality for varieties of people than have ever been, yet the media seems to portray our country to be one of the worst countries in the existence of humanity. Here's the point. Whether you fit into one of the old categories of stereotyping or one of the newer categories of stereotyping, no one likes being lumped together with a lot of other people. To be condemned simply because of your skin tone or national heritage or, or ethnicity. But what about the situation from the other direction? What if something good comes to you simply by being part of a group? You don't hear as many people object to that. You know, um, by the way, uh, your spouse won the lottery, so you're going to get a lot of money too. Like, oh, okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I'll be fine there. Um, oh, by the way, your sports team just won. Yay, we all won, we all won. I was like, what did you actually do for them? Nothing, but okay, yeah, we all won. Um, we seem to have a tendency to like that kind of thing. But if we're being honest about it, does it feel like a righteous judgment in those cases? Does it feel right receiving a trophy for something you didn't actually accomplish? Does it, anybody ever, you know, play the sport and they start, now today it's like everybody gets a trophy? <laughs> it's like, I'd rather just not. <laughs> I don't need your participation ribbon, like it's okay. Um, that's kind of my, my perspective, like, hey, that guy won, let him get the trophy and, and I'll be fine without, without anything. Um, it doesn't feel right to claim victories for things that I myself didn't accomplish. You see, God's judgment here, we're told, is given to each. It's personalized to what each has done. This means the following. God's judgment on how you handled your responsibilities, whether it be in marriage or as a parent or as a child or as a citizen or as a church member or as a worker or anything else you put in there, will be on the basis of your own performance, independent of what others did or did not do. This is good for us to remember, especially when we're saying things like, well, the reason why I'm not a good husband is because my wife is such and such and such and such. It's not dependent upon what your spouse is doing, how you're being called to account before the Lord. But in an even more significant way, we can also say this, salvation is not yours on the basis of someone else's conversion. Lloyd-Jones said it this way, Many have tried to persuade themselves that you can ride into heaven on the back of a saintly father or mother, or even a grandfather or grandmother. But here is the answer. No. <laughs> it's an, an individual judgment, not a familial matter. We will not be admitted as families with everyone who is in the family going in. Now that sort of thing the Jew believed. He believed that because he was a Jew, he was safe. But God will judge all men as individuals. I believe the same possibility exists in our own day for some who are maybe within this, this very church, maybe even some children in this very room who are believing themselves to be safe with God because their parents love Jesus, because their parents have been saved. Maybe some in this room or even older believe like, oh, I'm okay because I've got some relatives that have been walking with Christ for a long time. The same reply that was said to the Jews then is needful today, no. To each will a judgment be rendered. Remember, Revelation 20 describes the process whereby 
this judgment will happen, where the graves will give up the dead in them, the seas will give up the dead in them, all the dead will come before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're told that books will be opened that have a record of all the deeds of all the people who've ever lived. And the deeds there will be announced, will be brought before the Lord's judgment seat. And nothing escapes his notice, so these books will be entirely complete. And when all of that is listed, your guilt will be plainly evident. That is, unless there's another book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name is found in that book, then you're forgiven of all the other stuff that would have otherwise been against you. Why? Because Christ paid the penalty in your stead. More on that in a little bit. But notice, first of all, it's a personalized judgment. You're not being judged on what other people have done, which is good if you think that everyone else around you is worse than you, and, but not so good if you think that everyone else around you is better than you. <laughs> if you're banking on their deeds, it's not going to help you, and if you're hoping their stuff doesn't weigh you down, it won't, <laughs> but the problem is you've got the same problem. It's a personalized judgment. It's also a commensurate judgment. Look at the rest of verse 6, who will render to each according to his works. Each one is judged commensurate with what he or she has done. You see, a fair judgment involves getting what is deserved. Now, this is probably just pulling a quotation from several other places in the Bible. Some of the most notable, like Psalm 62, 12 says, Loving kindness is yours, O Lord, for you recompense a man according to his work. There it is. You render to a man according to what he's done. Proverbs 24, 12 says it similarly. See, we, uh, if you say, see, we did not know this, does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? Does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his work? Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. But it's not just an Old Testament principle. We see it in the New Testament. It's Matthew 16, 27, Jesus says, for the Son of Man is going to come in glory of his Father with his angels and will repay every man according to his deeds. 1 Corinthians 3, 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but will, each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Judgment will be based upon what each has actually done. Do not be deceived, Galatians 6, 7. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. So everyone will be judged for what he or she has done or not done by the standard of God's holy word and the law written on the heart, which we'll talk about a little bit later together. And what happens as a result of that is the establishment of two different categories of individuals. And this is what we see in verses 7 through 10. There's two categories of individuals, and many have commented this is a typical structural thing to find in Paul and others, this chiastic structure. Um, they'll usually list it with letters, or they'll say like, you know, A, B, B prime, A prime. So the idea is this, that the, you start with something, you move on to a second part, you then talk about the rest of the second part, and then you talk about the rest of the first part. Kind of like a sandwich of sorts. And we have that structure going on here. You'll see that there's two groups being described. First of all, the group who, in pers by perseverance, does what is good. Then you'll see, in contrast to those, those who are selfishly ambitious and don't obey the truth, who obey unrighteousness. And then you'll see the consequence for them. So you see the second group in verse 8. You see the consequence for them in verse 9. And you see the consequence for the first group that's listed in verse 7 down in verse 10. So we see this structure in how he goes about this. But I just want to talk about these two groups for just a moment. The first group is that which, was, which is described as those persevering in good work. They're peculiarly marked by steadfastness in doing good. In other words, setbacks and obstacles to doing good are not seen as insurmountable obstacles for these individuals, but merely as opportunities for applying grit and still doing the good, pushing through the difficulty. In other words, these people are not convenience do-gooders. There really is a difference, isn't there? There are people like, well, if it's on my way and it's, I'm not too, too hassled by it, I'll take care of that. That's a different kind of individual than one who's like, it's completely out of my way. It's completely contrary to what I was going to be doing today, but I'm there for you, right? 
This individual, these individuals are described as ones who persevere in doing good. They don't do good out of convenience. And when the doing good gets hard, they just get tougher and they go after it anyway. They're not dissuaded from the path of righteousness just because of opposition. In other words, we could say that they're a good foil to what we see in John Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress. These guys are the opposite of pliable. Remember pliable who joins Christian very early on the journey? And I just read a little, little piece of this to you guys just to remind you. It says, Now I saw in my dream that just as Christian and pliable had ended this talk, they drew near to a very miry slough that was, or slough, however you want to say it. Slough is like three different pronunciations. Um, that was in the midst of the plain. And they, being heedless, did both fall into the bog. The slow was called despond. Here, therefore, they wallowed for a time, being grievously debobbed with dirt. And Christian, because of the burden that was on his back, began to sink in the mire. Then said Pliable, Ah, neighbor Christian, where are you now? And Christian replies, Truly, I, I don't know. At that, Pliable began to be offended and angrily said to his fellow, If this is the happiness you've told me of all this while, if we had spent such ill speed at our first getting out, what might we expect for the rest of our journey to the journey's end? If I get out of this again with my life, I shall possess, you, should, you can possess the brave country alone. And with that, he gave a desperate struggle or two, we're told, and he got out on the mire on the same side of the mire as the city of destruction where he came from, and he went back to the city. We're told later in Bunyan's tale that when Pliable came back into town, the people there made fun of him and laughed at him and, and insulted him because they said, well, why did you start on a journey and then turn around after it all? Christian gets helped there by evangelist, and he continues on the journey, but the journey is not an easy one. The Bible does not describe the Christian life as an easy one. It reminds me also of uh, Jesus' parable of the sower. You remember the parable where seed is distributed out and it falls on different kinds of ground and to different effect. He describes and explains the parable in Matthew 13, starting in verse 19. He says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in the heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown in the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And then he says, then there's the man who is the good soil, where the seed falls and, it, and he hears the word and understands it and he bears fruit in keeping with it. He says there's varying productions of fruit. Some produce a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. But notice the, distinct, the distinguishing feature here is there's fruitfulness. <laughs> there's fruit among those. Whereas the other three, there wasn't any. This individual that's being described here, persevering in the good, is one who actually produces fruit in the midst of trials and difficulty. Look how they're further described. Those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality. Here we see what their desires are. If their demeanor is one who is persevering in doing good, their desires, their goal is glory, honor, and immortality. Now, it's not unusual to find men who might seek for these things. Uh, think about it, divorce from this particular context. It's like, doesn't every man want glory and honor and to live forever? I mean, isn't that what everybody wants? Well, we know from the context here that those words are being defined with a Godward intention, not with a selfish, self-seeking attention. It's not unusual to find men seeking their own glory but what's being talked about here is those men who seek God's glory, who seek God's honor, who seek an immortality that God alone can provide. The individual here seeks to be honored by the Lord, to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, for this is the honor alone that lasts eternally, and it rebounds the glory of the Lord himself. By the way, those who are positioned this way, have this kind of attitude towards the world, also think lightly of the world's appraisal of them. 
Because all that really matters is God's appraisal of me, not what the world thinks about me. This individual also recognizes the corruption of the fallen world that we're living in and longs for a day in which that corruption is done away with and replaced with incorruption and immortality. Makes me think of 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4, where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. This individual is being described here has a new heavens and new earth mentality, has a heavenward focus, has a longing for the fulfillment of God's kingdom, and that has a transformative effect on how he or she lives their life right now. Which brings us to the other description that's given here. If you look down, um, uh, again, verse 7, uh, uh, says, uh, glory, honor, immortality, eternal life, and then jump down to verse 10, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good. So this same group are those who then do good. They not only are intent on the Lord's things, but they actually work the good. They're not only well dispositioned and well intentioned, but well engaged. Those whose minds are set on things above do the good that they intend to do for the reason of God's glory and honor. In actual practice, those who pursue God's glory and work good with endurance live a life that pleases the Lord by God's grace. So that's group one. Contrasted with them are group two, which we see in verses eight and nine. Look at verse eight. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. And then look down at verse nine. It says, every soul of man who does evil. The first description we have of this group is that they're a group of, here in the NAS it says selfishly ambitious. Another word you could use to translate this is contentious. In other words, they're argumentative. These are individuals who operate out of fundamental disposition of argument with God. They're not in agreement with God. They're in a fundamental disagreement with the Lord. They array themselves in opposition to God's ways from the get-go. They're fundamentally opposed to what the Lord is doing. And that shows itself then in their demeanor, in their disposition. Look at it. Disobeying truth and obeying unrighteousness. So it ought not be surprising that those who live in disobedience to the truth then give themselves over, yield themselves to unrighteousness. They resist what is right and therefore they run with what is wrong. This has always been the case. You either are in agreement with the Lord and work as his servant, or you reject the Lord and you follow the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. See Ephesians 2. By not obeying the truth, by refusing the truth, by withholding belief, by obstinately being unpersuaded by the truth, they end up obeying unrighteousness, yielding to what is wrong. Sounds like Romans 1, right? Suppressing the truth on unrighteousness. So suppressing the truth leads them to immorality. Immorality leads itself to further foolishness. Amy sent me a link just that she found the other day. Um, you guys know that California has now declared that bees are fish? You guys know that? In a court of law, in an effort to protect bees, they decided to just claim that bees are fish because they already had endangered species laws on the books for fish. So all they had to do is declare that bees are now fish. But we live in a world that says man can be a woman, right? And a woman can be a man. So that's not all that much of a stretch. I guess chairs can be dogs and, you know, anything you want to make up these days. And that, that, but that's, that's the foolishness that we're living in, right? That's the absurdity that we're living in. When you suppress the truth and unrighteousness and you, you then swallow the lies of the enemy and everything starts to unravel. Everything starts to unravel. These are critics of Scripture and the Christian life. They attempt to tear down what God has built and, you know, replace it with something of their own invention, which usually means, in, in general, nothing, just destruction. And as we saw in the previous example, their disposition and their goals and impact what they do. So then in verse 9, we see that these are the souls of men who do evil. They're working evil. Since they're predisposed to rebellion, they reject the truth, they're slavishly given over to unrighteousness, it's obvious that they're going to engage themselves in evil doing. The point in this text, though, is notice that, that all of that disposition, all that stuff of the heart, eventually does show itself in action, 
in deeds, in work that is done. Someone might claim to be a great many things, but the question at the end of the day is, how does that claim show itself in actual deeds that are done? In other words, a good litmus test to ask of anyone who claims to be a Christian is just ask, what reality has happened as a result of your following Christ? Like, what's changed in your life as a result of loving Jesus? How does it change the way you spend your days? How does it change the way you spend money that God's given you? How does it change the way that you set goals and dreams? How's it, tr- how's it transformed you? God's judgment is fitting. It's personalized and it's in accordance with what each has done. It's also fair. With, with, God's, with God, there is never a miscarriage of justice. He'll, he always gets the verdict right. That's what makes justice today so hard, right? Is trying to actually get at it. Like, how can you be sure you did it right? God knows all. He sees all. He's all good. He's never biased. He's always impartial. He's just. He's right. He's holy. So therefore, he makes a fair judgment. God's judgment is fair. Two things to mention here. First, Notice the phrase, both of Jew first and then of the Greek. We see that in verse 9 and verse 10. You see this? There will be tribulation, distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Verse 10. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, Paul had already previously established back in chapter 1, verse 16, that he's not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We've already seen this phrase, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In some sense, the call of the gospel was to the Jew first. We know from God's plan unfolded in salvation history that the gospel was first presented to the Jews and then through the Jews it was to be presented to the nations. We see this in Paul's own pattern of ministry in the book of Acts. Early on in ministry, he would come into a town, he'd travel to the synagogue, he would reason with the Jews there that Jesus is the Messiah, the one we've been looking for and longing for. He's here. Jesus is him. And then inevitably, at some point, he would go out from the synagogue. Often it was the case that the Jews in the synagogue rejected the, the message of the gospel. And Paul would then go out to the um, outskirts of town and start talking with the Gentiles. So there's a sense in which it was to the Jew first because this is God's plan unfolded in salvation history where Jesus came to the Jewish people as the fulfillment, the the Messiah that had been promised so long ago. But what we learn here is that the fact that the gospel was first intended to come to the Jews and then to spread to the Gentiles does not then therefore exempt the Jews from judgment. In fact, what Paul goes on to say is it actually puts them first in line for judgment. There may have been some that felt themselves impervious to judgment because of their privileged position as the people of God in the Old Covenant. But rather than excusing them from judgment, it heightens their offense. Being first in line for hearing the gospel, having been prepared for the gospel through the Old Covenant, we can say the gospel was to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile, but it is also the case that the Jew is responsible if the Jew rejects the gospel and is thereby liable to judgment. So it's interesting. He can say the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek, and then he can say, and judgment is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. By the way, we see this this principle of heightened accountability um, from our Lord and Savior's own lips, a couple of texts. One of them, uh, a good example, is in Matthew 10, where... uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples about, he sends out the 70 to go into regions and share the gospel with people. And he says, if you come to a a house and they reject you and reject the message you have to bring, he says, you can just dust off your feet. He says, verily I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. He He says, Sodom and Gomorrah's judgment will be less severe to that which these houses will receive for rejecting me. He says similarly in Matthew 12, where he says, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. 
And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation to judgment and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the, Sol the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. You see, men are responsible for the light that God has given them. And judgment will be more severe for those who have been given more light and have thus still rejected it. I think this is, should be a solemn warning, especially for us in the United States. And if you're in this room, you have access to the gospel. <laughs> you have the word of God. You can have multiple copies of the word of God, right? You can have commentaries at your fingertips. Like, we have no excuse as it relates to hearing of the gospel. Notice also the other way that this text describes that in verse 11. And this is kind of the central point of this section. For there is no partiality with God. Paul here is talking primarily to Jews who had no problem condemning the Gentiles. And meanwhile, were they themselves engaging in sin themselves? And what Paul says here is God is not a face receiver. That's like a, a literal reading of this Greek word. He's not receiving face in different ways. All men are subjected to the same judgment, is the point. Perhaps you've seen the, how justice is like personified through statue form. Usually it's a woman who's blindfolded. The idea being that she's not allowing what her eyes see of various people to skew her judgment. There's other pictures of Lady Justice that have, sometimes you'll see scales in front of her, but other times you'll see her hands are actually tied behind her back. The idea being that justice doesn't take bribes doesn't have a handout looking for money in order to influence the judgment that's going to come. God's justice is impartial. We had read in Deuteronomy 10, 17 earlier, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. You see, while the Jews had great advantages, they had the law, the prophets, the oracles of God, they are justly judged if they fail to make proper use of them. He says those privileges don't end up helping you any if they don't lead you to the proper conclusion. Just because you have these privileges doesn't now mean that you're exempt from the judgment to come. Just because they gave you all this wonderful stuff doesn't mean if you reject Christ that you're okay. You're not okay. If anything, it just pushes you up in the line for judgment, puts you towards the front. In other words, with great privilege comes great responsibility. We who have been entrusted with much are called to use it well. We've seen God's judgment to be fitting. We've seen it to be fair. Lastly, this morning, I want just to note with you that this judgment is final. There are a lot of judgments that, by their very nature, are just preliminary. Uh, a good many cases, by the you know, by this fact in the United States, are you know, can be appealed by higher courts. Some decisions need review. Some are outrightly wrong, and we're thankful for an appellate court. By the way, in this case, the appellate court in California flip-flopped it. The, the lower court said, no, bees aren't, <laughs> bees aren't fish. And then they said, that judge was wrong. <laughs> bees are fish. Um, so this is the world we're living in, right? We know that, that courts can be wrong. Lower courts can be wrong. Higher courts can be wrong. Take Roe v. Wade, for example. What a tremendous grace and mercy of God if indeed the Supreme Court here very soon, if they actually do finally strike down the horrible ruling of some 50 years ago, which has led to the murder of so many babies in the womb. But it's an example, right, of how fallible man's judgments can be. Man's decisions are fallible. They're subject to unrighteousness. And we can thank the Lord whenever we come to a point where there are people in places like that who have the humility to admit we were wrong and that needs to be undone. Isn't it crazy that those are the people who are being demonized? But when it comes to God's judgment seat, dear friends, all decisions are final. There are no appellate courts. No one will be taking up their judgment on appeal. God's judgment seat is final. 
There are no reversals. And there are two eternal destinies that are set before us in this final judgment. In the first case, to every soul working evil, tribulation. There's four words here in the text. Tribulation, distress, wrath, indignation. Those are the four words here. Tribulation, distress, wrath, and indignation. Why is this God's response? I like the way that Haldane explained it. God, as the sovereign judge of men, receives from their, them their good and evil actions. Sinners do not calculate upon this righteous procedure. They commit sin without thinking of God and without considering what he remembers of all their actions. There is, however, an invisible hand which is treasuring up all that a man thinks, all that he says, all that he does. Not the least part of it is lost. All is laid up in the treasury of his justice. Tribulation is a word that means pressing or crushing. It's used to describe being beaten and battered and bruised. Distress denotes anguish or extreme affliction. In other places, it, it describes a, a narrowness of place, being constrained or confined. Some have said that as a result, like thinking about heaven and hell, uh, one of the ways we could describe it is heaven is kind of being likened, you know, the old song, a big, big house with lots and lots of room. That's kind of a, a appropriate to the description of it, whereas hell would be more likened to like solitary confinement. It's an interesting instance, by the way, in which these two Greek words happen in another, uh, another context in Paul's writings. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8, Paul says, we as Christians are afflicted in every way. That's the word tribulation. We're, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. That word crushed there is the word distressed or constrained. The word's here. It's interesting. He goes on to say perplexed, but not despairing. So Christians... What he's saying there is we're in the midst of our own sort of tribulation, but it's a tribulation without anguish. It's a tribulation without the crushing, without the distress. We might be afflicted and pressed, but we're not ultimately constrained or ultimately um, crushed. But the souls working evil will be sent to hell on the day of judgment, and they'll experience both tribulation and distress and agony, and anguish. Look like the other two words are used here. Wrath, a settled righteous anger is what's being described here, and indignation. Words usually describes explosive, holy anger and fury. Again, Haldane puts it well. Wrath and indignation united mark the greatness of the wrath of God proportioned to the dignity of the sovereign judge of the world to the authority of those eternal laws which have been violated, to the magistri majesty of the legislator by whom they have been promulgated, to the favors which sinners have received from him, and proportioned also to the unworthiness and meanness of the creature compared to God. Some of these people say, like, how can God be rightly wrathful and indignant against people he's made? Because of what we have done in response to that. It's proportioned to his dignity as the sovereign judge of the world. It's proportioned to the authority of eternal laws, which he has set down. It's a proportion to the majesty of his, his place as legislator and proportioned to an understanding of just how rebellious we have been. The wages of sin is death, and we deserve eternal, everlasting torment in hell. That's what we deserve. But notice then, verse 10, to everyone working good, what happens? But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then look back at verse 7. It says to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, what do they get? Eternal life. Glory and honor, we already talked about those two phrases. The word peace here is given as well, a crucial part to our relationship with God. Jesus Christ grants peace with us and God through what he has done in our behalf. And then eternal life, the, the ultimate uh, description of, I think, both the, the condition and quality of life as well as um, its quantity. The ultimate destination of those who are declared righteous in God's sight are granted eternal life. That's something that's given now. The eternal life is knowing our Heavenly Father, being rightly related to Him, having been justified through the blood of Christ. But then it also shows itself in continued fellowship with God in Christ, a possession of peace that transcends understanding, a joy that is full of glory, the love of God being poured out in our heart.
The judgment that is coming is fitting and fair and final. Now, the message of a final judgment is certainly not a popular one today, but it is a needful one. It will be an individual judgment fitted to each what each one has done. Every soul, every man will be brought before the judgment seat of God and a perfectly just, impartial, and unalterable judgment will be made. John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Nothing in Scripture indicates, by the way, that the, the wrath that's being described there is temporary. Matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. 2 Thessalonians 1 says, For after all, it is just, only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Now, when people see that word eternal destruction, they're like, well, can't that just mean cessation of existence, like annihilation, like they're just gone forever. That's what it means. Some would say that. The problem is that doesn't square with what the rest of the Bible does in describing what that means. The consequence, by the way, of many of the wicked in Jesus' parables you see throughout Matthew. Check it out, Matthew 13, Matthew 22, Matthew 24, Matthew 25. You'll see that the consequence for the wicked in each of those parables is that they're thrown out into outer darkness. Another description is that they're thrown into a furnace of fire. And in all cases, the description of that place is there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you don't exist, you can't weep. If you don't exist, you can't gnash your teeth. Also notice the lengths to which we should go in reference to pursuing eternal life, given the awful alternative as the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of it in Mark 9. He says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better to enter life crippled than have two hands and go into hell, the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. By the way, that description happens three more, two more times in that text. As if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. Better for you to enter life lame, have two feet, be cast into hell, worm doesn't die, fire is not quenched. Your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. Better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye, than have two eyes, be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. This is why when we speak of hell, we don't speak of it in a flippant manner. This is a solemn subject. Hell is not a joke. Because of our sin, we all deserve hell. The wages of sin is death. And because none of us have kept God's law perfectly, either outwardly or inwardly, or even the spirit of the law, we're all guilty and deserving of eternal punishment and torment. But the same God who is holy, the same God who is righteous in all of his judgments, is also gracious and merciful. Now, the sad thing is a lot of times today, people only talk about his grace and mercy, but it doesn't make sense apart from understanding him as also as holy and just. What are you being saved from? Why do you need forgiveness if, if God just doesn't care about righteousness? You see, God has provided the one and only means for man to be rescued from sin and its consequences. This is described in various ways, but it all points to one thing, one reality. God provided his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to fulfill the righteousness that we lack and to lay down his life in our stead, to take the punishment for us. We'll be looking more at this in chapter 3. <laughs> in some ways, I'm like getting ahead of myself. But how can we end right there? This is where we're going to be spending a lot of our time in, in coming months. But it's worth noting now, because if right now in this room you are despairing of your own ability to be right with God, good. <laughs> you can't. You can't save yourself. If you'll admit your unworthiness, and if you'll admit that you deserve hell, you're now in the right place to understand the gospel. If you admit that you're unworthy, and you admit that you deserve judgment in hell, now you're in a proper position to repent of sin and call out to Jesus to save you. The whole point of this section is to reiterate our inability to live a righteous life. Here's the standard by which God judges. And if we were to look at this, apart from Christ, 
none of us would be in the first group. All of us are in the second group. The only way you can have heaven as your home and not hell as your just desserts is by embracing Christ. None of us have persevered in only doing good. None of us have kept our eyes upon the glory and honor of God. All of us have fallen short. Doug Moose says it well, quote, Paul sets forth the biblical conditions for attaining eternal life apart from Christ. Understood this way, Paul is not speaking hypothetically, but once his doctrine of universal human powerlessness under sin has been developed, see chapter 3 verse 9 especially, it becomes clear that the promise can, in fact, never become operative because the condition for its fulfillment, consistent, earnest seeking after good, can never be realized. What he's saying here is this. Can someone get to heaven by always pursuing godliness and living for the Lord and doing what's righteous? Yes is the answer. It's not hypothetical. Yes, God will judge that perfectly. The problem is we're not able to do it. The problem is that humans are not that way. If you were that way, you could be saved that way. But none of us are that way. And that's what Paul is going to pains to explain. Because he knew among his audience, there would be some out of a Gentile pagan world that would immediately go like, oh yeah, that's me in Romans 1. Praise the Lord for having saved me out of that. But he also knew, Romans 2, that there are some in the congregation that are like, well, we're God's privileged people. We've kind of stayed away from a lot of that seedy behavior. And Paul's going, you're not, you're not innocent of wrongdoing. The same God that will judge that will also judge you. So the only hope you have is to confess your sin. The only ha hope you have is to stop attempting to earn your way to salvation and to heaven and solely trust in the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and man who is able to rescue you. And then with that in mind, if we then look again at group one, group one exists Group one exists only by and in connection with Christ. Christ did that. Christ persevered in doing good. He sought the glory, honor, and immortality. He's the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore, to Jesus belong glory and honor and peace. For he did nothing but good. And the good news is of the gospel... That if you're found in Christ, you then also become a joint heir with him. And then, if you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, your life will then start to demonstrate the very things that are being described here. Those who know the Lord are being sanctified and transformed more and more into his likeness. Sin is being put to death daily and the Holy Spirit within us is causing us to live for righteousness and for God's glory. This doesn't mean that Christians never backslide. This doesn't mean that Christians never have, have mistakes. We do. We're in continual need of God's grace and forgiveness. But the overall course of our lives is then seen in seeking after God's glory and honor. Because we've been changed by God's grace through what Christ has done for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Thank you for reminding us of a coming judgment. Thank you for providing a fitting and a fair and final judgment, one that we know is right and just and holy. But Lord, we also thank you that you're also gracious and merciful and provided your son Jesus to rescue us from our own sin and the consequences that would fall to us otherwise. Lord, I pray that you would help us to communicate this message to a watching world. That they would understand that the reason why we talk about hell is because it's real. Because there is a judgment actually coming. Even the most hateful thing we could do to not warn people about the reality of what's to come. Help us to communicate truth and love. May they see from our behavior and our, and our tone of voice and our, our demeanor, that we share this with them, not as people who aren't otherwise also condemned to hell, because we would have been, but surely by grace and mercy we've been 
forgiven and brought into your family. Help us to be good ambassadors of that message. We pray even in this room, Lord, if there are any who have been like, you know, thinking they could just rest on the coattails of someone else or maybe even there's a few children in this room, Lord, that, that feel that they're okay just because their mom or dad love you. Convince them of the reality that they themselves need to repent. They themselves need to make, um, make a confession of their own sin and trust in Jesus to save them. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.